Welcome to special coverage on Yahoo Finance on what has been a very busy day for markets in the economy. I'm Brian Sazi, and we are live from Frisco, Texas at J.P. Morgan Chase's Make Your Move Summit. Big focus on small businesses, the health of small businesses, and the outlook for these small businesses. And let's chat more on this with our very, 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 very special guest, J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, Chairman CEO, Jamie Dimon. Jamie, thank you for doing this. Good to see you again. Good to be here. Appreciate Appreciate it. it. So we're going to talk about the health of small businesses. This conference is going to be very, very packed tomorrow. But first, we're a few hours removed from Fed Decision Day. Your assessment of what we heard from the Fed. Well, my real assessment doesn't matter that much uh, because we don't know the future state of the economy, which they've basically been telling you now for months. And I think they did the right thing to raise rates rapidly. And I think they're kind of right to pause here a little bit and see what happens. Uh, but I suspect that they may not be done. I think there's a chance that inflation is just a little stickier than people think. And the fiscal and monetary stimulus of the last you know, several years is, is more than people think. Unemployment is very low. Uh, we'll see. They have a long way to go on inflation. I think Chairman Powell, Jerome Powell, uh, made that very clear. How much higher do you think they have to go on rates? So you have to separate rates since the short end. Mm-hmm. And it's called the 10-year. And on the short end, they are, you know, five and three-eighths, whatever, maybe 25, 50, 75 more. You know, and I'm not predicting that. I just think there's a higher chance than probably other people think. The 10 years not set by them. So that went up. You know, they influence it with words and stuff like that. But that's supply and demand of buyers of bonds from around the world. The supply is up dramatically, much more than people would have expected even a year ago. Uh, and QT is also uh, increasing the supply of bonds out there. So is Japan, China, and some other you know, prior buyers. So that I think there may be pressure in that 10-year rate to go up. Inflation is stickier. Uh, you know, it's not abnormal to have a 55 or 6% or even 7% 10-year rate. And you know, I, I don't look at that as a prediction. I look at that as come more like risk management. You know, don't, don't rule it out when you look at how you manage your company, that rates can go a little bit higher. I should also point out the spreads are still very low. So credit spreads themselves can go up. So you know, there can be a little bit of a double whammy for, for borrowers. Has the economy felt the impact of the Fed's rate hikes? And then I know you've talked a lot about quantitative tightening. Has markets and the economy felt these things yet? Yeah. So the, 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 the Fed, you see it. Like, remember, mortgages are a lot of fixed rates, but it's clearly affecting uh, house sales, uh, home sales, and stuff like that. Not home prices yet. There's still a lot of money out there. and uh, But it's affecting auto sales and credit card and... Uh, over time, it'll affect businesses that have to refinance any floating rate bar. So, so yeah, of course, it's depressing certain economic activity. It's hard to figure out exactly how much. Quantitative tightening is almost more of a technical thing, like what's enough, when's enough. I personally believe that, that at one point it will rattle the markets. It kind of did in March 2020. It did, if you go back to uh, 19, market makers are more... Are, are more they can't do as much as they used to do for a whole bunch of different regulatory reasons. And so I think at one point, yeah, you're going to see markets get a little little rattled. And where does that rattling show up first, you think? Treasuries. Treasuries. Yeah. And that hasn't, has the Treasury market been rattled already, just given the ascent we've seen in the tenure? Not, well, if you look at, not really, but liquidity has come in. Uh, and, you know, you should try to keep an eye on that. And like I guess that there's more issuance. And the issuance has to be bought. And it may, you know, that may push the price higher. So uh, we haven't seen real tre- you know, uh, pressure in the repo markets, the overnight markets. Chair Powell mentioned uh, the 8 percent mortgage, and he sounded somewhat uncertain what that may or may not mean to the housing market yeah. next year. What are you seeing in housing in this country, given where rates are? Yeah, well, first of all, the big thing, keep in mind also, very different than prior times. We have, we have still a lot of fiscal stimulus with very low unemployment. And, and consumers actually in rather good shape. They have low, unemplo- uh, low unemployment, uh, home prices and asset prices have gone up for the better part of 15 years. They may be now and now, but their, their equity in their home is at all time records. They locked in a lot of fixed rate financing, particularly in mortgages, which is like 70% of consumer borrowing. So they're actually in pretty good shape. You know, it, but it's definitely dampening new home buyers, slowing down people's ability to move. People today are you know, doing adjustable rate mortgages, but the cost of carrying a mortgage is higher. So, you know, buyers either are going to buy a smaller house, which is a choice, or they're going to wait or, or, uh, or not buy at all. What should, there's a lot of regular average people using Yahoo Finance consistently. That's the hallmark of our pl- platform. What should they be prepared for in terms of the economy because of where rates uh, are right now? Yeah. I think the most important thing when you think about the world is think about it broadly 
and don't just try to guess that there's one thing that's going to happen. You know, almost no one has ever forecasted accurately like what I call real inflection points. And so when I look at it, is, again, as a risk management thing, the most important thing that's taking place is geopolitical. It's, it's Ukraine, Israel, war, death, you know, free nations in Europe. It's affecting everything, obviously a humanitarian crisis. It's affecting uh, global trade, global alliances, very importantly, America, China. Uh, so I, I put that as, I, I would put that in the worry category. You don't know, and I don't want to, this is so important, the geopolitical part. Yes, it'll have an effect on the economy. And it'll may determine whether the economy goes to a hard landing or a soft landing, but we don't know that yet. I mean, hopefully these things will diminish, but they may not. So, you know, as a, someone running a company, I try to run the company such that whatever the range of potential economic outcomes are, we could serve our clients. We'll be there in thick or thin. We can bank cities, states, schools, hospitals, individuals, that we can invest in our technology, that all these small businesses who rely on us, that we're there for them through thick or thin. We're building, we're going, and you know, we can manage the, the economy, which I look like the weather. So I guess my advice is, look at a potential range of outcomes and challenge yourself how you feel about if those range of outcomes happened. And so, uh, so, you've, so you've really thought it through. And in you do that before you say, this is what I think is gonna happen. In terms of higher for longer rates, is that the new normal? And what does it mean for big banks like JP Morgan? Yeah, so I, I personally think we may have gone, you may have had a sea change. And the sea change was that we've had 20 years plus of r lower rates. And, and now all of a sudden, it looks to me there's a lot of long-term inflation. So if we get monthly numbers and stuff like that, long-term inflation effects, a $2 trillion deficit, the largest peacetime deficit ever, the largest peacetime deficit with all-time unemployment lows, uh, but you also have commitments that are being made. You know, the IRA Act, the CHIPS Act, the green economy, we think will eventually cost $4 trillion. I hope it's well spent, though I suspect a lot of it will not be well spent. Uh, you know, in Europe, when oil and gas prices went way up, they basically financed it for all consumers and producers. You know, so government, and then we have aging populations, Social Security, Medicare. There's a lot of concerns. But there are a lot of things which I say are future inflationary. Mm -hmm. I don't see anything which is future disinflationary. Now, of course, recession is disinflationary, but, but I see all these trends, so it may be a sea change, so that you know, if you go back to the 70s or 80s, you know, rates were higher, they were kind of more volatile, people didn't, you know, no one looked at a 2% rate like that was normal. Are, are the, have the seeds been planted for something like a Volcker recession? Look, I'm not asking you to predict a recession, yeah. but are, are, have the seeds been planted? Well, when you say Volcker recession, okay, so remember interest rates got to 14 and three quarters of the 20 year bond mm -hmm. in 1982. I, I mean, unemployment hit 10 or 11. Uh, so I, I'm not, I don't think we're gonna go there. Like I said, the consumer is in very good shape. So even if we go into recession, the consumer's going in be better shape than they've gone into most recessions uh, uh, and companies are still hiring workers. So it's not quite clear. I mean, I, I wouldn't call it that bad. I just think that the, there's a lot of deficit financing and that may cause long-term rates to go and stay higher in inflation for a little bit longer. How concerned are you about, about the deficit, and, and what do these rising deficits also mean to, to the economy longer term? Well, you said, okay, you said, what does it do for JP Morgan? JP Morgan, we run the company, so it's that if there were 7 or 8% long bond rates, we're going to be fine. We, we don't, we don't, we're not guessing for it, but we stress for it. So, you know, we stress for a whole bunch of different things to basically to make sure we can handle low rates high rates, high rates with inflation, high rates with recession, high rates with real estate losses, that no matter what those are, the JP Morgan is still in pretty good shape. Fortress balance and, and, pre and pretty good shape means that we can serve our clients regardless of that. That's what it means to me, not like, well, if that happens, I gotta, I gotta pull back, I can't invest, I can't grow, I can't serve people, and, and so we'll be fine. I suspect that those higher rates, you know, Warren Buffett talks about when the tide goes out, you see he's yeah. dressing, <laughs> swimming naked, you're gonna see quite a few people swimming naked. They had embedded rate interest rate exposure they didn't understand. They couldn't take the double whammy of, of you know, stagflation or you know, bad real estate or something like that. So you know, people, any business person, when I always talk to small business, I would say be prepared for a range of events. You know, if you're a restaurant and you have you know, only so much extra days of cash on hand, and then you have a hurricane like Superstore and Sandy, you know, that can bankrupt you. 
But you don't want that to happen because you should think through what you need to protect yourselves against, you know, out certain outcomes that you know, are possible, hopefully unlikely, hopefully don't happen, but are possible. I, I, on the right over here, uh, Jamie, I see all the new buildings and, and things going up here in this area yeah. in, in Texas, and I, uh, Texas, and I see the economic activity. But then I hear stories about higher rates, economic slowdowns. From a J.P. Morgan perspective, are you tightening your lending to businesses? Not. I mean, we t we. I call it trimming the sales. So you always do it a little bit. So we weren't big in subprime auto, but I people are trimming the sales there, and they should. We've never, we're not really big in subprime credit card. You know, real estate a little bit. You know, because real estate, you know, commercial real estate, there's too much vacancies, and so you're not going to be doing the same kind of activity you were doing before. But uh, but it, but this is. I mean, you, we should play. This state is amazing. I hope a bunch of you guys are from Texas. I mean, this state has been booming. It's been conducive to business. You know, they're making it good to come here. Uh, and that's, that's infrastructure, education, housing, uh, uh, you name it. So we now have 10,000 people in Plano we didn't have before. We bank, I think, we bank six or seven million small businesses around the country, which is almost double what it was like, you know, seven or eight years ago. Uh, and small business formation has gone up dramatically with COVID. And I, but I have to remind the people, small business formation, it doesn't happen on its own. The 10,000 people we had in Plano probably have 20,000 people in small business servicing them. That, and that could be barbers, taking care of a house, electrician, lawyers, engineers, consultants, uh, uh, people who are not at J.P. Morgan, but they're part of our ecosystem now. And so, uh, so th this is the kind of vibrant economy you want. I've, and and I, they, we should make sure we keep it that way here. We now have more employees in Texas than we have in New York. Wow. You know. 17,500? No, in Texas we have 30,000, mm -hmm. something like that. In wow. New York is now 26. When I got to J.P. Morgan in 2004, we had 12,000 here. Wow. And and and, my, and, J and New York was like 36,000. I'm an avid consumer of J.P. Morgan Research. This is how oh, I good. really I start yeah. my day. They, Once, they are unbelievable. They are awesome. They're awesome. So they put yeah. out a, a really interesting note today. One stat that stood out to me, and I, I have to get your take. It said this: For the middle class, real liquidity is back to pre-COVID level, while the bottom 40 percent are worse off compared to before. Why yeah. is this happening? You know, well, what happened was, if you look at, if this was the average checking account, and make believe it's all one consumer, all that money, at one point they had multiples of what they had pre-COVID. That money is being spent down. If you look at that, what I just said, but you look at the lower, and, and we, there are different ways of looking at it, it's hard to tell, and some inflation adjusts and some don't, but it looks like the lower, call it the third, is back to where it was pre-COVID. They don't have excess savings anymore. And that the middle class is getting close to zero, no excess savings, but they still have jobs and wages are going up. And then obviously wealthy people still have excess and stuff like that. We've, we've seen that number coming down. And, you know, as a matter of fact, I saw three forecasts the other day. One said, one, all from JP Morgan. One said it's going to come down by the end of the, I guess, by the first quarter of next year, one was the third quarter of next year, one was the end of next year. Because, uh, like I said, there are a lot of different ways to measure it. Uh, you mentioned um, in your annual letter earlier this year, another great quote, you said, we require a 21st century government. Yeah. I imagine what we're seeing currently in DC is not what you had in mind. Yeah. I mean, I'm begging Texas don't become like DC. <laughs> I mean, DC goes out of its way to make it hard to, uh -huh. for, for small to large businesses to grow and expand. And uh, yeah, no, what I'm talking about there is we need, and it's not everywhere, but inner city schools have to do a better job getting their kids education to get them a job. You know, making fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year. Our infrastructure, you know, which you see when you drive around, if you go to and if you go to Hong Kong or Singapore, it's a little embarrassing. You know, so some of our regulations are they're barnacles. They've been there for years. They should be taken away because they're just slowing down growth. So I mean, I'm in favor of good regulations, just not endless regulations. And our litigation system, in many cases, slow, capricious, arbitrary, and very expensive. And if it led to more justice, I, that, you know, you and I might say that's a good thing. Our healthcare system, we have the best in the world, you know, pharma, doctors, science, hospitals, you know, which I'm a big beneficiary of. We have some of the worst outcomes in the world. Child mortality has gotten worse. Mother mortality has gotten worse. Obesity has gotten higher. Uh, I, I don't think we've done a good job taking care of our lower paid citizens. They're the ones who lost their job in COVID. They often live in a part time with more crime. Uh, they often don't have medical insurance. You know, I think we've done a terrible job in some cases. I think we have to do a better job for society as a whole. And um, well, how does this yeah. administration do a better job? In their last year before election, November what? November seventh. How can they do a better job? What would you like to see from them? I, I tell I tell them privately what I think they should do or not do. So. 
No. Is there a but way? But some of these things are not Democrat or Republican. I mean, the FAA needs to be updated. That's been true for 20 years. Mm -hmm. We have an antiquated technology system. Everyone, I think almost everyone else around the world has a modern technology system. Ours is still those green screens that you know don't adjust quickly and, uh, and it's dangerous. And someone told me that, not only is that, 20% more CO2 in a flight and 20 minutes on the average flight, just for that. What, in terms of uh, just growth, you know, are there policies that this administration has put forward that have excited you and that you could be hopeful for? Yeah, you know, I think, I think in some ways we had to do a CHIPS Act. If you want people, I think we need to have someone built here for our own safety and security. Uh, uh, and so I think that's probably good. I think part of the, inf I'm in favor of the Infrastructure Act. We need infrastructure and part of the IRA Act, but both on infrastructure and IRA, although I think they should come, they should have come with twins and they didn't. Those twins to me would be fast permitting because you see every single day you can't build certain things. It could be pipelines, it could be solar, it could be wind, it could be roads because it takes 10 years to get permits and that makes their capital cost much higher and people are canceling those projects. And the second is you got to stop the social engineering. It's, it's bad economics. It redu dramatically reduces the efficiency, and it also opens up the corporate trough. You know, people have to, they're begging to get more, not, not just money from the federal government, but from the city, from the state. And it shouldn't have social engineering. It shouldn't require unions. It shouldn't require place-based childcare, which most companies do anyway. It should just be a tax credit to do X and no other interference. And, you know, unfortunately, it's, the other interference is growing dramatically. Uh, I'm a, of the view that you take what you say very carefully, you put a lot of thought into it. So it really took me, I guess by surprise on last earnings release when you said this is the most dangerous time yeah. in the world that you have seen. Can you just expand upon that? What, what are you most concerned about? Yeah, well, it started before the terrorism in Israel with the Ukraine war. I knew it the day afterwards. A free, democratic, European nation was invaded by hundreds of thousands of well-armed troops of Russia, uh, protected by nuclear blackmail. And that nuclear blackmail part, you know, just put in the back of your mind, you want to scare people? We, if you have nuclear proliferation, that's the worst thing. Now, at the time, we said we don't know how it's going to end and when it's going to end. Uh, now it's, uh, you know, not quite two years, but going, you know, it'll be two years in February. You have 600,000 casualties along a 600-mile front with no real end in sight, and it's affecting, you know, obviously humanitarian crisis, but oil and food security is paramount and it's shown the world we don't really have that. It's stretching all alliances. You know, people trying to figure out who's, you know, who's on what side here. And obviously the most important is what it, it's hurting and damaging the ability of China and America to, you know, strike a better relationship. And so I, I think, and then you have the Israeli Terrorist Act and those, those things are bad. You know, and, you know, I look at, like, the Berlin Wall, you know, that went up and came down, not a bullet was fired. You know, you have 600,000 casualties here. And so I look at it, this, this is maybe a little bit more like pre-World War II. Like, you know, we, we got to get this right. And I think I like the fact that the Biden administration and others now, Mitch McConnell or, you know, and leaders are saying, this is, we need to take care of this. It is for America. Because if we don't fix this, you can have, the world may not be completely safe for freedom and democracy as we know it for the next hundred years. And to do it, by the way, we need very, obviously the military stuff is important. We also need diplomacy, development, finance. We have to work with our allies. So one of the, one of the problems of the IRA Act was it irritated all our allies. It, you know, it, we don't want to tear us under the economic alliances because you know, all these other people are going to cherry pick. And, and so we have to be very careful how this gets navigated you know, over the next five or 10 years. In light of these challenging geopolitical situations, uh, the dysfunction we're seeing in government, is that hurting our standing in, in the world at such a critical time? America, I think the way you should look at it in the world is if we reach out our hands to people, people are gonna take it. You know, they, they may get mad at us sometimes for being a little arrogant, a little bit thoughtless, but we are trusted. You know, and we have, and we're the only ones, and I'm not saying this is an arrogant American, we're the only ones who could provide the leadership because we have the military, the muscle, the might, the money, the capability. We've got to do it in conjunction with allies. It can't be the ugly American. We're not going to get our own way every time. Uh, and I think they understand that. They are rattled by, you know, when they see something, you know, if you, if you look at American policy, it's been less consistent. So they do say, can we trust you? Will you be there? Will the treaty stand? 
you know, and, I, and those are legitimate concerns. It's not over, but we've created a, a certain amount of uncertainty that I wish we hadn't. You've, uh, you've sounded cautious on the economy, and you have so in the past, but you've always been upbeat about America. Yeah. What are you so hopeful for about America looking out over the next decade? Yeah, no, I, listen, I just met with uh, Bloomberg, and I told them the same thing I'm going to tell you. I am a full-throated, red-blooded, patriotic, free enterprise, proud American. This, this country is the most prosperous nation the world's ever seen. And, of course, we have flaws. There is not a nation on the planet that doesn't. But we are, and we're a moral nation. We didn't go to war in World War I and World War II to grab land or oil or money or gold or any of that. And then we did the Marshall Plan. I think you know, we need to do Marshall Plans again to help some of these other folks. That is the forefront of keeping the world safe for democracy. And so and I'm proud of that. It's still the most prosperous nation the world's ever seen. You know, and when people, like, look at China, we have 80,000 per person GDP. Theirs is 15. We've got wonderful neighbors. We've got the best military in the world. We've got the most innovation the world's ever seen. And that innovation, it, you know, it used to be like Boston and Silicon Valley. It's now here. It's Austin. It's Nashville. It's, and it's also going overseas, by the way. So, you know, I'm surprised now when I go to, you know, Berlin and Paris and London. They've got quite a bit of it, too, which I think is great. And so we have all that, you know, we, and we should applaud that. And we should sing the praises of that. And we should help and we should grow. Acknowledging we didn't take care of the bomb 25% very well. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and that's after decades of trying. So and I think there are things to fix that. Like I, I would double the earned income tax credit. I know Republicans and Democrats who would do that. So I think there are things we can do that could strengthen the company, country, help the lower end, and get, get the country growing more. And one of the, and the other thing we've got to talk about more is growth is the way out of this fiscal mess we're in. Okay, growth will drive more tax receipts, more jobs, more capability, more production, more supply side. And we don't spend enough time talking about what fosters growth. Here they do. I mean, look, well, look at the difference of Texas versus some other well, states. small businesses foster growth. To the small business yeah. here, 2,000 people are going to show up at this yeah. conference, three-day conference here in Frisco, yeah. Texas. They are concerned about inflation. They're concerned about the economy. What's your message to them? How can they grow their businesses? First of all, I'm the, my first message, I'm proud of them. Mm-hmm. You know, anyone, if you talk to anyone who's ever started a small business, and I, I'll do, I always do this here, what's the, what's the thing that you recognize, what's the most important thing? How hard it is, how proud they are, how fun it is, how, much, how hard they're working, uh, and we want to help them. So we have, you know, we help them with money, we help them with advice. We now have these small business consultants, which uh, you're going to hear from Ben about tomorrow, which I think is just a, a, a wonderful thing. And so, uh, so that's the first thing, I'm proud of them. And they're part of that wonderful ecosystem. You know, plan a little bit. Some, you know, a lot of people, you don't automatically know what to do about a budget or a lease or where do you open your next restaurant, something like that. But plan a little bit. And, you know, one of the great things about these, they learn from each other, you know. And so uh, this is the fourth city you've done. I think four cities, and I don't know how many, much more you're going to do. But, hell, I, when I was driving, I say 1,800 people, we should do this in every city in America. Yeah. I mean, it's unbelievable. So it's motivating for us to see the dynamism in uh, these companies. So Before we let you go... Um Look, I've, I've followed your career for, for some time, Jamie, and now we're starting to get this next generation of leaders, not just in Wall Street, uh, but just in, in my field, a lot of different fields. What's your advice or, or tips to them you know, as they try to navigate this new level of uncertainty as someone who has borne witness to some of the biggest financial events in the past 25 yeah, years? You know, study everything. Learn, learn, learn. Don't get rigid in how you think. You know, I've been reading four five newspapers a day for like 30 years. Uh, at 5 a.m., 5 a.m. Yeah, right? oh. and, and be open-minded. When you look at an issue, assess the whole issue. So I talk about China. They don't have enough food or energy. Yeah. I talk to many people. They don't know that China imports 8 million or 10 million barrels a day of oil. So people should understand the full situation, analyze the whole situation, and don't let yourself be weaponized. Because, you know, if that happens to press, it happens to individuals, you know, li- listen to what people have to say, and, and, but ask the second question. Are they right or are they wrong? What, what determines whether it's right or wrong? And so, uh, you know, all, the, all people should make sure they are thinking clearly. Have a decision process. I think the press is so important to educate the world. You know, you guys, and one of the reasons I spend time with the press, you educate the world. And that's readers, but it's also you're educating influencers. And by that I mean the politicians, their staff, uh, universities, all these people who help influence the course of society. So you, gotta, you have to do your job well. That is part of what keeps America safe and sound. Well, uh, Jamie, you, uh, you've just educated millions of people around the world with this interview. We thank you for the time. We really, thank you. We really appreciate sure, it. Sure. Uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, Chairman and CEO Jamie Diamond, thanks for joining Yahoo Finance. And we'll be right back after this short break.
Welcome to Yahoo Finance. You were just listening there to an interview with JP Morgan's Jamie Dimon by our very own Brian Sazi. And I want to welcome Brian in now. That was a great interview, Brian. Congrats on that. You all touched on a lot of important topics, trends, themes. I'm, I'm just curious, what stood out to you, Brian? Well, uh, Josh, I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. It was a real honor to welcome uh, Jamie back onto the Yahoo Finance platform. Really, what stood out to me, and, and uh, I'm just reflecting on a little bit, I think it was Jamie's thoughts on, on the markets uh, and the outlook for, for interest rates. Keep in mind, this comes after uh, you, heard, you heard Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell uh, really sound, I think, a cautious tone in the economy and the lagged impact of higher interest rates. But I think Jamie, uh, Josh, really weighing in on the state of rates. And I think we have that clip from him. We'd love to uh, run that again to, to uh, really highlight uh, some of the things he had to say. I think they're kind of right to pause here a little bit and see what happens. Uh, but I suspect that they may not be done. I think there's a chance that inflation is just a little stickier than people think. And the fiscal and monetary stimulus of the last you know, several years is, is more than people think. Unemployment's very low. Uh, we'll see. So very important point there, I think, Josh, by Jamie uh, Diamond on the outlook for rates. You saw markets, I would argue, start to price in. Maybe the Fed is done with rates. But you listen to Jerome Powell on that conference, uh, at that conference or that press conference today. Didn't really sound like he's ready to call it all quits yet on that inflation fight. Of course, uh, Jamie Diamond uh, appears to be echoing that sentiment as well. And, you know, Brian, I also thought separately uh, the time you spent talking geopolitics, I thought was really interesting, too. Clearly top of mind for Jamie Dimon. He talked about, of course, Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine, the impact that's had on oil and food markets, talked about the Israel-Hamas war. That was clearly another concern for him looking ahead. Yeah, uh, right on, Josh. And this is really uh, what we've seen in markets over the past four weeks. This is what we call geopolitical risk getting priced into stocks in real time. Now, it perhaps has not led to the market sell-off many thought when some of these situations broke out. But nonetheless, uh, Josh, you're really trying to get, I think investors are trying to get the sense of how much geopolitical risk should be priced into stocks. And when we say that, what do we mean? It means this. Uh, should these situations, of course, Israel, Hamas, does that lead to higher oil prices for a sustained period of time? And if it does, what does it mean to corporate earnings? What does it mean to how people hire or corporations hire for next year? These are markets trying to determine these things very much in real time. And I would argue that is why we've started to see this pullback in stocks, not just the S&P 500, but of course in the Dow and various tech stocks as well. You know, Brian, let's bring in two guests right now to talk a little bit more about this interview and Mr. Diamond's thoughts on such a wide range of topics, monetary policy, fiscal policy, geopolitics. We've got Mike Mayo here, Wells Fargo Managing Director. We also have Mark Zandi, Moody's Analytics Chief Economist. And Mark, I want to start with you there because Brian did talk to Jamie Diamond about the Fed, their rate hiking campaign. As we're talking about there, Mark, uh, Diamond saying they did the right thing uh, to raise rates and now pause in his opinion. And then he said they might not be done. Inflation might be sticky. We'll see, he said. Love to get your reaction to that, Mark. Yeah, I, I agree that, that the Fed did the right thing, uh, raising rates very aggressively uh, beginning back in early 2022. And I think they've done a very good job of slowing the economy down. And uh, given that the pandemic and the Russian war is now in the rearview mirror, increasingly so, inflation is coming in to script. So I think all feels pretty good at this point. And, you know, he's right. Uh, they, they could raise rates again, for sure. Uh, you know, the economy is showing amazing resilience. But I think the most likely scenario, kind of in the middle of the distribution of possible outcomes, is no more rate hikes. I mean, it feels like to me, everything is kind of cooperating for the Fed. And most importantly, inflation is coming in. In fact, the only uh, uh, thing holding inflation back from where it is to the Fed's target is the cost of housing services. And that feels like that's gonna come in given weak rent growth and a lot of multifamily supply coming into the market. So yeah, it's certainly uh, it's a, a scenario that we could get more rate hikes, but I think the most likely scenario is that we are done. And I think today's market action would suggest that now is the consensus view. Mike, one of the takeaways for me uh, from my conversation with Jamie, and then also looking at what the Federal Reserve had to say uh, today, rates are likely to stay higher for longer. As someone that covers bank stocks like you do and who has uh, covered bank stocks for an extended period like you have, what do these higher rates mean 
to a J.P. Morgan, a Wells Fargo, a City, and all the other big banks? Well, I'll comment as it relates to J.P. Morgan, and I think the interview showed why Jamie Dimon and J.P. Morgan is the LeBron James of banking, good at both offense and defense. And on the offense side, Jamie Dimon was there with the interview in Texas, saying how much he loves Texas, trying to improve market share in Texas, um, and saying they have more employees in Texas than they have in New York. So I thought those were interesting figures. And by the way, on the offense side, J.P. Morgan still benefits from higher interest rates. And on the defense side, Jamie Dimon showed healthy paranoia. He showed why he is the warrior in chief. He talked about rates, and it's not about guessing, it's about stressing. And higher rates, uh, you know, they do benefit J.P. Morgan. So they've been positioned about as better than any other large bank uh, through this whole rate cycle. Um, as it relates to a recession risk, he did mention consumers are in good shape, but they don't take that for granted either. He talked about uh, mortgage uh, activity. Uh, and as it relates to regulation, he says good re regulation, fine, but not endless regulation. So I see in the interview the positive trade to both offense, trying to gain share on the ground there in Texas, and defense with the healthy paranoia. So, Mark, let's talk a little bit more about this warrior in chief here. He did bring up some other worries. It was geopolitical, I thought, it was clearly top of mind for Jamie Dimon. And he talked about the Russian invasion of Ukraine. He talked about the Israel-Hamas war. I'm interested, Mark, as an economist, how you think about those conflicts and the potential dynamics there. I mean, investors, it seems right now, have, have figured as horrible as those conflicts are, investors seem to think they're going to stay contained. How, how are you thinking about it? Well, uh, there, there is a lot of geopolitical risk uh, everywhere, uh, but I'd say that's kind of the state of affairs. Uh, you know, I don't know that there's a time where we don't have flashpoints around the world that have real consequence for the global economy, for our economy. Uh, with regard to the things that are kind of the, the geopolitical risks that are kind of the top of the list right now, the Russian conflict, war in Ukraine, uh, you know, it feels like the wor worst of the economic fallout is behind us. Now, obviously, a lot of risk around that because the con the war is still ongoing and can go in lots of different directions. But, you know, the impact had its max was at its maximum over a year ago when oil was over $100 a barrel and food prices, agricultural prices were rising. So that feels less threatening from an economic perspective. And the uh, Israel uh, Israeli war with Hamas, you know, obviously a lot of risk around that, but, you know, it feels like as long as that's contained and doesn't disrupt Iranian oil supplies or supplies more broadly in the Middle East, the uh, it's hard to connect the dots back to the global economy in the U.S. Now, again, I, you know, I don't mean to downplay any of this. These are very serious risks, but at this point in time, the most likely scenario is a scenario where these things don't upset the apple cart, don't uh, undermine the global economy or the U.S. economy. Mike, I'm going to be thinking a lot about tonight, the outlook for housing. You had Jerome Powell throw out uh, at his press conference 8% mortgage rate uh, and that impact that might have on housing looking out to next year. I think Jamie Dimon sounding a, a note of caution on the outlook for housing. How concerned are you that given how fast rates have climbed up, that we are heading to a bad situation in the housing market in this country? Um, well, I'll let Mark start if you like, um, but um, look, the banking industry had a big lesson with the global financial crisis and housing, and typically banks don't make the same mistakes twice in a row. So in the 80s, it was lending to South American countries. In the early 90s, it was commercial real estate. In the early O's, it was commercial and during the global financial crisis, it was mortgage. So I don't think it's time for the big mortgage problems. I think the underwriting there has been very tight. And a lot of that activity has moved outside of the, the, the banking industry. So uh, overall, uh, banks, when they disclose how much exposure they have to homeowners, I think that's a stronger uh, category versus exposure to renters. Um, so that's not the top of my list. I, you know, there's certainly commercial real estate, which J.B. Diamond mentioned the low end consumer, a business that the largest banks really have gotten out of uh, would be further up there um, and some other areas I would watch before mortgage. But don't forget what's happened the last 10 to 15 years, the de-risking among the largest banks, including JP Morgan. You have twice as much capital, twice as much 
liquidity, um, stress tests, um, you know, so many precautions. Everyone is thinking when you hear recession, you think global financial crisis. So you had your big mortgage blow up. I don't think you're going to have that again now, but there's other problems out there. Maybe it's exposure to, um, you know, non-bank financial firms. I think that's an area that would need to be watched. But in aggregate, you, your loan losses are not likely to approach the level of recent recessions if we go through a mild downturn. And I think that point is missed on the market. And I think that part is missed in JP Morgan stock valuation. Mark, I'll let you chime in here as the, as the uh, economist of the group, get your take on housing, where we are and where we're headed. I also, Mark, though, I want to get your take on what uh, Jamie Dimon said about the consumer because he first said the consumer is in very good shape. And then Brian pressed him a bit and he said, well, actually the lower income consumer, uh, they don't have excess savings anymore. And the middle class is close to zero. The wealthy, he said, are doing okay. So interesting to get your take on the health of the consumer as well, Mark. Yeah, I, I would agree the way he characterized it. I think in aggregate across all consumers, uh, sitting pretty, uh, lots of jobs, low unemployment, wage growth is above inflation, uh, debt service is very low, people have locked in the low rates. You know, uh, Stock prices and housing values have, are down flat over the last year or so, but people are still a lot wealthier than they were prior to the pandemic, and of course all that excess saving. So in totality, the consumer is in a very good spot, and that's the key reason for optimism that you know we're just not going into recession because it's got to be the consumer that leads us in, and it just, it just doesn't feel like that's likely to happen. But having said that, there is this soft part um, among the bottom third of the income distribution. Those folks are stretched. You know, they've been struggling with the high inflation. They have worked down their excess saving. They are vulnerable. They have been the folks that have been borrowing against their cars and consumer finance loans, and that's where delinquency rates are up. But I'll end with. Uh, you know, a statistic, the folks in the top third of the income distribution account for two thirds of the spending. So I don't think the economy can flourish if the bottom third isn't uh, doing well, but it can it can it can continue on without recession, just given that the top third does the bulk of the spending. Mike, uh, last one uh, for me here, you know, just sitting next to, to Jamie for a good 15, 20 minutes, you come away for the sen with the sense that He's in, he remains incredibly engaged. He knows everybody. And this is the person you want to put a call to uh, when things are getting tough out there uh, in the economy or in markets. You just, you just get it. Having said that, you know, there is the next generation of Wall Street leaders coming into uh, the picture here. Now, of course, you have Morgan Stanley last week with Ted Pick getting that CEO role from James Gorman. What is your assessment of this next generation of Wall Street, Wall Street leaders? Do they have that it factor that Jamie has long had? Uh, there is no other Jamie Dimon right now. You know, I've had my my battles with Jamie over the last 25 years, and sometimes I agree and sometimes I disagree. Like a couple of years ago when they were spending a lot of money without telling us why they were spending so much. But I think what's remarkable is the Jamie Dimon taking the same advice that he just gave you in the interview is don't be rigid with your thinking. Incorporate new information. When I, uh, along with many others, were saying, hey, why are you spending so much money? What's the end game? Why don't you tell us more about it? They went ahead and had an investor day and told us about that. So the degree that he's engaged, like he's on the ground in Texas, he's talking detailed financial numbers, he's talking business numbers. I don't see another Jamie Dimon right now, but that's, you know, you sometimes need to become CEO to get in a position like that. So that's why I call Jamie Dimon the, and his firm, JP Morgan, the LeBron James of banking. But it starts with being warrior in chief, thinking about what can go wrong, not being dismissive about problems. So that's what I am always looking for, first and foremost, before even the offense side. Mike Mayo and Mark Zandi, thank you guys for joining us so much today for your time and for your insight. And Brian, thank you for that great interview. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for watching.